my name is Mara Linsky Deegan, and I am the Associate Curator and Registrar here at the Charles H. McNider Art Museum, Mason City, Iowa. And today we're going to talk about the artist Chuck Jones. Uh, Chuck Jones was born in Spokane, Washington in 1912, uh, but when he was a little boy, his family moved actually to Hollywood, California, uh, where he grew up. And one of the fun things about um, his life is that when he was a small child, he actually was an extra in films. Um, and that's kind of how he got his, uh, I wouldn't say acting bug, but his, his bug for being in uh, films. And he um, actually was able to uh, realize that dream later on, and we'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. But he decided that he definitely wanted to be an artist, so he went uh, to um, high school and then in college he went to what is now the California Institute of the Arts. In 1932, um, he decided, yep, he definitely wanted to be an artist, and he actually was very interested in the animation industry, and he thought this would be a great way that he could be um, a part of the film uh, industry, but then also uh, use his art skills. And so he got a job actually not creating um, animation, but washing the animation cells that other artists would create. He'd wash them off to get extra paint stuff off, and that was his first job in the industry. And he worked for a small company, um, and then also in 1932, when he got his first job, he met his wife Dorothy, who also uh, at the time worked at that same animation company. So I think that's kind of cool. He worked at the small animation studio, again, washing cells. Um, he got a job with Leon Schlesinger, and his production company uh, at the time made Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies um, uh, cartoons that then were uh, distributed by Warner Brothers. And so um, that was a big step in the direction of um, creating animation uh, for a bigger audience. The fun fact about the artist Chuck Jones, um, when he was a young man in the 1940s, um, he actually worked with Dr. Seuss uh, creating uh, videos during World War II that were educational videos about the army and kind of maybe a little bit of promotional videos. And because of that relationship, he was able to later on work with Dr. Seuss and um, create animated um, specials uh, from his books. And one of the most famous ones is one that we still watch today. Uh, at least I watch it every Christmas, and that's The Grinch That Sold Christmas. And the next time you watch that on TV, if you look at the animation uh, section, it says who animated the, the, uh, the Christmas special, uh, Chuck Jones' name will be right on there. So in the 1930s, uh, Chuck Jones started to work for, actually for, Warner Brothers Studios in their animation department. And he worked there from the 1930s all the way up into the 1960s. And he is responsible um, for uh, penning or creating uh, cells like this one of a lot of characters. Um, and he actually created characters himself, ones that he made up. Um, this is one of them. This is Michigan J. Frog. He also um, was the creator of Pepe Le Pew. Uh, Marvin the Martian, and also Wile E. Coyote and the Roadrunner, who are all people that I grew up with, and I bet some of you guys know who those people are as well. Fun fact about Chuck Jones, in the 1950s, uh, the Warner Brothers uh, studio, uh, for a time, in just a few, um, a year or two, closed their animation studios. I'm not sure why, but when they did that, um, Chuck Jones actually went and said, you know what, I'm a great animator, I'm going to go to where animation is uh, really popular, and that was Walt Disney. So he actually got a job a little while working for Disney, and he's uncredited, but he helped with uh, their film that came out in the 1950s, uh, Sleeping Beauty. In the 1960s, um, Chuck Jones decided to strike out on his own, and he actually created his own um, animation studio, which was called Sim Tower 12, and he worked uh, on his own stuff for a few years until 1964 when uh, his animation studio was absorbed by MGM, uh, which is a movie studio, and they wanted an animation uh, section. So that absorbed his um, animation studio into their realm, and then he worked um, with them until, the until 1970 when they actually decided not to have an animation studio anymore. And then he was freelance again. Freelance just means he works by himself and um, just kind of on his own. And then in 1976, he started Chuck Jones Studio. And um, he was tied again with Warner Brothers. He did a lot with Warner Brothers, especially having such um, iconic characters as Michigan J. Frog and like people like Marvin Martian and um, Wiley Coyote and Roadrunner. He 
continued his uh, work with Warner Brothers Studio until his retirement. Um, and uh, one of the things I'd like to talk about with this piece specifically is what an animation cell is, because that's what this is. We call this an animation cell. And so what it is, is it's a piece of plastic, special kind of plastic, that the artist uh, paints a, a drawing on it, or draws and then paints it. <laughs> and then that is what's used when you have a lot of them. You take a picture and then you take another picture of the same character, but maybe move just slightly. And then you take another picture with the move is slightly more. Like if you wanted Michigan J Frog here to tip his hat forward, you might start with the first drawing being all the same except for the hat closer to the head. And then each time you might do another cell, another one where the hat's just a little bit further away. So then you're gonna take a picture of each one of those cells. And then when you put them together and run them really fast, it looks like the character is taking off their hat. And so back in the day, so in the 19 teens, 20s, 30s, all the way up until uh, the 1990s, that's how they created cartoons. They would paint on a piece of plastic. They would do the outline on the front of the piece of plastic, the black outline you can see here on Michigan J Frog, and then they would have usually somebody else go through and do what we call coloring, which means they actually take the image that was painted or drawn on one side, they flip it over so they can still see the outline through and they paint on the back. The reason they would paint on the back is so that they could really hide the edges because if you hide the edges behind there, you can't see where the paint stops. But then also it hides the brush strokes because the brush strokes are on top. And so if you do it on the back, when you flip it over, you see the bottom, which just looks nice and flat, like this black color, if that makes sense. Uh, one of the other things about animation cells is they usually have a background, like this one does. When you look at it, you can kind of see a yellow circle here, and then what looks like, if you've seen it, and you've ever seen the Merry Melody car cartoons, you know that they have kind of a, a little curtain in the background when they start. That's actually the background, it's on a piece of paper. A lot of times that will be static, which means it doesn't move, so they just leave that there, and then, like I said, with that tipping of the hat, they would use the same background each time so that it looks consistent, and it just looks like the frog is tipping his hat, but the background doesn't move at all. When they were first making animation cells, way back in the day, um, they decided that they wanted to use a plastic that would hold up, so they used something called celluloid, so it's celluloid, oh, it's hard to say, nitrate. And it was great, it worked great, but the problem was it didn't store very well. It was kind of unstable, and sometimes it would catch on fire or it would melt, and they couldn't save them. Uh, so uh, probably a little bit, I'd say in the 40s and 50s, they moved to celluloid acetate, and that's something that continues to work, uh, and is a lot more stable, and it continues to hold up even today. But like I said before, in the 1990s, something big changed. I want you all to think what you think changed in the 1990s between the way that they used to do the cartoons and the way they do cartoons a lot of the time today. Uh, but you can think about it, it's computers. So nowadays, if you think about what cartoons look like, like things like Pixar movies, um, anything from Disney, they are made with computer animation, so they don't actually use cells anymore. And it turns out that a lot of places like Warner Brothers and Disney don't use any cells anymore. So things like this, they're usually from 1990 or before.